It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Rosengren, our speaker this evening. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, he has headed the Boston Fed since 2007. Um, and before that, he was head of the supervisory and regulatory side of the Boston Fed's work. And that's an interesting thing because, uh, as we were discussing just before, uh, for a macroeconomist to be uh, leading the soup and reg side of a, uh, one of the reserve banks is, is unusual. Um, and I think, in fact, Dr. Rosengren had a bit of a reputation in the profession of being uh, that rare macroeconomist prior to the 2008 crisis who did focus on bank balance sheets and the credit channel more broadly. Um, so, um, you are going to speak to us about uh, the US economic outlook and implications for monetary policy, uh, and then we'll be taking questions from everybody here. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am gonna be talking from a PowerPoint. Make sure I can. Uh, so, the UK and the United States are probably the two fastest horses in a very slow race. Uh, if you look around the world economy, among various uh, developed economies at least, uh, the United States is at the point where people are talking about when we should raise rates. Similar uh, situation in the UK, that uh, both economies are in a much better place than uh, most other developed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about U.S. monetary policy and how we're thinking about it, uh, but be glad to answer any questions on the international economy, but this is going to be more focused on U.S. monetary policy. U.S. monetary policy is at the point where we clearly are thinking a little bit about when it is appropriate to be raising rates. And at our last FOMC meeting, we laid out two conditions. These conditions are not nearly as specific as we were uh, coming out of the financial crisis and for the first several years. When we were at that point, we were very far from where we wanted to be. As a result, we could be pretty clear that we were pretty far from where we wanted to be. We're now a little bit closer. We're a little bit more data dependent. And that means that the kind of guidance that we're providing is not nearly as specific as what you would have seen before. You can see from the slide that there are two conditions that we laid out. The first was before we want to raise short-term rates that we need further improvement in labor markets. And the second is that we have to be reasonably confident that inflation is going back to 2%. In some sense, this is just a description of our dual mandate. It's saying that we need to get back to full employment, we need to get back to our 2% inflation target. Those are the two areas that are the focus of monetary policy in the United States. A little bit different than the Bank of England or the ECB that only has a single mandate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. So have the conditions been met? Well, I would argue not yet. Uh, first, looking at labor markets. Uh, in the U.S., we just had an employment report. That employment report was actually fairly weak. We were creating 126,000 jobs. That's pretty slow for the United States relative to what we've been doing over the previous year. Our unemployment rate's at 5.5%, and it didn't change at all. So in terms of labor markets, um, we haven't really seen the rapid improvement uh, that we were hoping to continue to see. And in terms of the core PCE inflation, which is how we've determined our inflation target, um, we're at 1.4%. Our target's 2%. So we're not there yet. And if, I'm going to show you a chart in a little while that's going to focus on the fact that inflation actually, since the financial crisis, has been well below 2% for all but a very short period of time. In order to determine when we think it's appropriate to be raising rates, um, it's really important to understand our forecasts. And we've become much more transparent about our forecasts recently. We provide what's called the Summary of Economic Projections, which is the people that vote on monetary policy in the United States. When we're at uh, full complement, we have seven governors and we have 12 reserve bank presidents that vote on monetary policy. Currently, we only have five of the seven uh, governors because we're waiting for one appointment and we're waiting for the Senate to take action on the other. Um, but each of the presidents and each of the governors, whether they're voting or not, actually put in a projection for where they think uh, 
uh, a, a number of economic variables will be over the following two to three years. Uh, we provide a projection for where we think unemployment will be. We provide a projection on where we think inflation will be. Uh, we provide a projection for where we think interest rates will be. So it is pretty transparent about where we think the economy is going. Uh, I would say the last summary of economic projections that came out at that same uh, March meeting uh, did have a fairly large change in short-term interest rates forecast by the participants. And I'll show you a chart at the end that highlights that. Normally, the focus actually is on uh, the federal funds target and where we'll be at the end of each year. Um, but I would say that there are other important aspects of the summary of economic projections that didn't get nearly as much attention that in this case actually are quite striking. The first one is the, the unemployment rate that the monetary policymakers think we're going to be in the long run. And I'm going to talk a little bit why that's important in a minute. The second is where we think the federal funds rate is going to be in the long run. That's important because it kind of determines how steep a slope. So you not only care about when are we going to raise rates, but you care about how quickly we raise them as well. And so where you think the level of the Fed funds rate will be in the longer run actually is quite important to determine how steep that uh, increase in rates needs to be to completely normalize the interest rates. So it, it's quite relevant for monetary policy on both these variables. And let me just talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's clearly relevant when and how much you raise short-term interest rates, as I've just described. It's also relevant to a, a debate that's occurring in the United States right now. And if you saw uh, Chair Yellen's testimony in Congress, you would have heard a discussion between her in Congress uh, in a number of questions about a bill that is being considered that would require the Federal Reserve to provide a simple monetary policy guideline that we would follow and that we'd have to explain when we were deviating from that simple monetary policy guideline. There's a long economic tradition thinking about simple rules. Milton Friedman talked about simple rules tied to money aggregates. This simple rule actually is a little bit different. It's tied to some work done by John Taylor, a Stanford economist, who basically argued that um, if you look at where we are relative to our inflation target, and you looked at where we are relative to full employment, that you can come up with a fairly standard rule that kind of guides what Federal Reserve policy would be. Unfortunately, that very simple rule that Congress is thinking of actually potentially legislating um, turns out not to work so well when the economy's changing. And the two variables that I've just focused on are two of the variables that are actually critically important. You have to understand where you think the unemployment rate's going to be in the longer term, and you have to understand where you think the federal funds rate is going to be in the longer term. And those simple monetary policy rules assume that both those variables are constant. In reality, our projections indicate that not only do we not think it's constant, but over the last three years, that we've changed our own views about both those variables quite substantially. Now, the Fed does have a dual mandate, um, but the dual mandate's treated in a very specific way. So inflation and unemployment are the two things that uh, we're focused on. We're trying to get to full employment, and we have a 2% PCE inflation target. We're quite explicit about our inflation target. It's a numerical number. It's tied to a specific index. So there's not much uncertainty, in part because monetary policy, particularly over the longer run, should be able to hit its inflation target. And most central banks actually have an inflation target that has been explicitly stated. The United States is a little bit different in terms of the full employment goal. But there we're not nearly as specific. And we provide, uh, at the beginning of each year, a statement that talks about what our longer term strategies are. And you can see that uh, in that long term strategy, we talk about the maximum level that employment can be is not just determined by monetary policy, but really determined by factors that the Federal Reserve has no control over. And I'm going to talk about that. Some of the demographic changes that are occurring, not only in the United States, but globally, uh, 
means that the unemployment rate may not be the same unemployment rate uh, over time. The ability of matching people that are unemployed with jobs may not be the same at all times. And so as a result, we don't provide a specific unemployment rate that we're trying to reach. It actually requires judgment to determine whether we're getting to full employment or not. So we state quite explicitly in our strategy statement that these factors may change over time and may not be directly measurable. So let me turn to the summary of economic projections for what we think the long run unemployment rate will be in the United States. So keep in mind right now that the unemployment rate in the United States is five and a half percent. And go back to June of 2012, so once a quarter we provide these projections. And in this chart I have two things. I have the central tendency. Uh, the central tendency means of the various participants, you throw out the three highest and you throw out the three lowest. And so that gray area is showing you the range of views throwing out the three highest and the three lowest. And then I show you a dark line that's the midpoint of the central tendency, uh, literally just the, the midpoint of the two opposite ends of the, the range. And if you look back to June 2012, you can see a, a couple things. One is the range was quite large, roughly from five and a quarter percent to six percent. And you can see over time, though, that those views have changed quite dramatically. Uh, if you were expecting that full employment would be 6% back in June of 2012, you definitely should be for tightening now because we're at 5.5%. So you'd be a half percent below what uh, the full employment view was at that time if you didn't change your views. But what this chart shows is actually that the views did change particularly for the people at the high end of this range. So you can see that as you move over to the right to the December 2014, the range is now just 5 to 5.2 percent. A very narrow range, midpoints at 5.1. So relative to the people that thought that 5.5 percent might actually be overshooting where we needed to be, uh, now most of the participants have the view that we still have a ways to go. So if you move your target, it is going to affect what you think is appropriate policy. So from 5.5%, if you're at the bottom of that range, which is where I am, I would be at 5% being consistent with full employment, then we're still a half a percent away from where we want to be. Obviously, if you're at the top of that range, we don't have as far to go. But this illustrates the fact that what we think full employment is in the United States does change over time. And that does have an influence on when and how much you think we should be raising rates. So during this period, um, the, the participants of the FOMC have both narrowed the range and come down in terms of what they think is the appropriate level of the unemployment rate over the long term. So why would that be? And why would there be uh, such a large change over just a three-year period? Well, in the medium term, uh, one of the reasons is our traditional measure of unemployment may not capture all the dynamics in labor markets. One example of that is what I'm showing you in this slide. So this is persons employed part-time for economic reasons. What that is is a person who would like full-time employment but can't find full-time employment, can only find part-time work. So they're working less than 34 hours a week. But they would prefer that full-time employment. Frequently, the part-time workers are not getting all the benefits that a full-time worker would get. And so there is a desire to, to move to full-time employment. These people are classified as employed by U.S. statistics. But as you can see, for part-time workers, there was a dramatic increase during the financial crisis. And it's remained quite elevated. So um, we're still at levels that are dramatically higher than we were at the previous period. Since these people are classified as being fully employed by the normal measure of unemployment, this kind of variation wouldn't be captured in the way that we normally capture the unemployment rate. So for those that, you, that do follow the United States, and the difference between the U3 and the U6 can be pretty large. And this part-time for economic reasons is that broader measure of slack uh, in the labor markets. And this indicates that even if we were pretty close to full employment, 
that there's still a fair bit of slack because there are a lot of people that are part-time that would prefer this full-time work. Now, another reason for why I think many uh, participants at the FOMC have viewed uh, full employment as changing is because both wages and prices have not been hitting where you would expect if we were at full employment now. So this shows you the core rate of inflation uh, using the CPE, uh, PCE uh, price index. You can see the blue line at 2%. That's our target. And you can see the recession shading for the period during the financial crisis that we had the recession. To the right, you can see that we've been pretty systematically undershooting our 2% goal. We just got up to it uh, for a very short period of time uh, during the recovery. And the 1.4% remains quite low relative to that 2% target. So if you're not seeing inflationary pressures pick up, uh, then we're probably not yet at full employment. And in fact, if you look at the labor market, we're really not seeing the labor market pressures that would be consistent with having very tight labor markets at this point. So what this chart shows is by various occupational categories, what the uh, employment cost index for wages and salaries is. And you can see prior to the financial crisis, the period to the left here, uh, that wages and salaries were growing much more rapidly than what we've seen since the financial crisis. If you thought that we were getting close to full employment, you'd expect that at least some of these occupational categories would start hitting bottlenecks. And when you hit bottlenecks, wages and salaries start going up faster than they were had been before, you can see that you can see a, a few of the areas where there's been an increase in wages and salaries, but overall it still looks pretty flat. So a very low and a very flat wage and salaries is not what you'd really expect if you thought that we were at full employment at this time. So I think the most persuasive reason for why so many of the FOMC participants have changed what their view of full employment is is we're really not seeing the wage and price pressures picking up. But there may also be demographic reasons for why uh, full employment may have changed. So this chart shows the age distribution of the US civilian labor force in three different periods, 1994, 2004, and 2014. And you can see the 16 to 24 year olds, and this is a trend that's occurring in most developed countries, uh, you can see that we're having much lower number of people entering the workforce who are quite young. That tends to be groups that have very high unemployment rates. And if you look at the other end of the distribution, people with white hair like myself, you can see that there's been a very rapid increase. That's just a reflection of the aging population, but usually people in their 40s and 50s and early 60s tend to have very low unemployment rates. So if you have a demographic change, that does have an implication for what you think the unemployment rate should be over a longer period of time. If we were having a lot of new entrants into the workforce, you might expect that the equilibrium unemployment rate would be uh, reflecting the fact that they're gonna have a little bit more difficulty finding work than somebody who has the job skills and has been in the workforce for an extended period of time. So demographic reasons may be one reason why full employment may change over time and why it may in particular have come down over the last 10 years. A second area that has changed uh, relatively dramatically over that same time period is educational attainment. So educational attainment is just meant to proxy for skills in the workforce. It's clearly not a perfect uh, measure of, of skills in the workforce, but you can see that there's a fairly dramatic change that's occurred here as well. So if you look at to the left here, the less than a high school diploma or a high school diploma, uh, that workforce has been going down uh, in those areas. And what you see is people with a bachelor's degree or higher has been going up fairly dramatically. If you look at the unemployment rate by educational attainment, there are big differences in these categories as well. Higher skilled workers, workers that have uh, higher educational attainment, tend to have much lower unemployment rates than people that have less skills and less educational attainment. So as you start seeing these demographic changes, you would expect that the unemployment rate that we'd eventually expect to see would actually go down, reflecting a skilled workforce that may not be as impacted by the various fluctuations that are going on in the economy.
So there are a number of implications from uh, this. The unemployment rate that's consistent with full employment looks to have declined. Estimates of full employment can change, as we made very clear in our statement that we've been adopting at the beginning of each year. But the SCP kind of highlights that it has changed, at least uh, by the estimation of the various policymakers that provide uh, quarterly projections for where they think full employment will be. This variable is really important for thinking about simple monetary policy rules, because the simple monetary policy rules that are captured by rules like the Taylor rule actually don't expect that the long-term unemployment rate is changing. And so the fact that it's changed so dramatically over the last three years, if we followed the prescriptions from a simple monetary policy rule, we would have had the wrong answer. We would have had too tight a policy. Let me now turn to the second area that I think is really important coming out of the forecast that we provided in March. And that's where we think the longer run US federal funds rate would be. So this chart set up the same way as the first chart that I showed you on the longer run expectations for employment. <clears throat> and so if you go back to June 2012, again, this is throwing out the three uh, extremes um, at both the top and the bottom. And you can see back in June of 2012 that the participants of the FOMC thought that the short term federal funds rate in the longer run was going to be between four and four and a half percent. But the same pattern emerges here that as you get closer to the current period, that midpoint has come down and the range has shrunk. So what that means is that if you thought that we were, for example, needing to get to four and a half percent, to get from zero to four and a half percent, given that we have eight meetings a year, if you thought that we got behind the curve, that might imply some fairly rapid increases. But as you lower your projection for where you think we have to be in the longer run, you don't need as steep an increase in interest rates to get to that point. So the equilibrium federal funds rate that people think we're going to have in the longer run has come down quite dramatically. So let me explain a little bit why that actually makes sense. First is a phenomena that you might expect is reflected globally. And this just shows you the 10-year government bond rates uh, for the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. And particularly for those central banks where the 10-year rate has gotten very low, it's pretty hard to talk about a 10-year rate that is well below 2%. Uh, being consistent with people being confident you're going to hit your 2% inflation target because you're saying on average over those 10 years, you're going to be locking in a negative real rate of return for that entire 10-year period if you hold the 10-year bond to maturity. But another explanation for why the rates have come down is that you think that the short-term real rate has also come down. There are a number of hypotheses for why the short-term real rate has come down. Uh, for those of you that have looked at Larry Summers and Ben Bernanke, I have a blog that have been going back and forth about various reasons for why they think uh, the real rate may have come down. Uh, Ex-chairman Ben Bernanke uh, has highlighted the savings glut, and that's more of a global phenomenon, which would be consistent with the kind of charts that you see here. Larry Summers has talked about the lack of opportunities in terms of investment opportunities. Either one of those explanations, I'm not going to go into detail about that debate. That, that would be for a much longer talk. But uh, the bottom line is those are two explanations for why you might think that the short-term real rate uh, might be coming down. Another reason might be that people are much more risk averse. You might be saving a lot more if you're a little bit concerned coming out of the financial crisis that you want to be much more liquid than you might have felt that you needed to be prior to the financial crisis. So this just shows that for US households, they're holding a lot more checkable deposits and currency than they were holding prior to the crisis, which may be reflective of this greater degree of risk aversion. And the same thing's true for firms as well, though it's not quite as striking. Uh, another explanation that would be a little bit more consistent with the Larry Summers view of the world 
is this is a chart of productivity. So if you thought the economy wasn't nearly as productive as it was before, there wouldn't be the same kind of investment opportunities. As you can see, this measure of productivity, much higher during this period than the last few years. So at least uh, by this measure of productivity, it does look like the US economy is not as productive as it was earlier. So what are the implications of a lower, uh, longer run equilibrium federal funds rate? Well, the first is that we think that the federal funds rate and the real federal funds rate have declined, then that means that we don't have to raise rates nearly as much when we think that they need to be fully normalized. So that means that the steepness of how much we have to tighten monetary policy isn't as great as we start thinking that these rates uh, are actually much lower than they were previously. The second area that I would highlight is that we've been at the zero bound for a long period of time, and it's not unique to the United States. It's a global phenomenon that we're at the zero lower bound. But when you're at the zero lower bound, it means that you can't respond to negative shocks with monetary policy in as flexible a way as we normally can. So we can do quantitative easing and other types of tools. But normally, most central banks like to be working at the short end. And in the United States, we're normally moving the federal funds rate. So the fact that uh, we think that the real rate may have come down and that the long run uh, federal funds rate may be lower has implications for what you think an appropriate inflation target ought to be. You might argue that if you're worried about hitting the zero lower bound too frequently and not using monetary policy to offset, offset negative shocks, that you should actually potentially have a higher inflation target than was picked by many central banks prior to the financial crisis. In the United States, it was shortly after the financial crisis. But it does mean that we should reflect a little bit on how we're picking our inflation targets if you don't want to hit the zero lower bound too often. And finally, uh, real interest rates can change. And at least by uh, the estimate of the people participating in monetary policy in the United States, we think that they have changed. That has implications for the simple monetary policy rules. The simple monetary policy rules basically change the, assume that those rates don't change which means that they have pretty much a constant target in the longer run. This says that that constant target has changed. And so that if we were to legislate one of those simple rules, it would actually be a problem. I would highlight that these simple rules also don't include quantitative easing and many of the things that uh, central banks around the world actually employed uh, coming out of the financial crisis. So to sum up, oh, before I summarize, uh, this is the chart that I promised uh, that I would give you, which is actually uh, where we think that the federal funds rate will be at the end of the year. These dots, the so-called dot chart, uh, was published after the FOMC. And you can see that there has been a change. Uh, the dots have moved down. Um, the, the modal forecast is 0.625. Uh, for the federal funds rate, that would be consistent with two tightenings by the end of the year. Um, but that is down dramatically from what we were seeing uh, at the December FOMC. So yes, uh, there was an expectation that short-term interest rates would not need to be as high at the end of this year relative to what we thought in December. But it also reflects these other factors that you may not need to be in as much of a rush to raise rates if you don't think we have to raise rates as much to normalize the rates. And if you think that the real rates and uh, full employment have changed uh, over the course of the last two or three years. So concluding observations, simple rules that are being considered uh, legislatively probably are not appropriate for monetary policy. The world's much more complicated than a simple rule. We learned that with money aggregates, and we're learning that now with the Taylor Rule, that this would be a particularly odd period to choose to adopt uh, a very simple rule, because the variables that are assumed to be constant in those rules not only can change, but at least by participants' views have changed. Uh, while they're not effective for actually setting policy, they are effective in terms of a rule of thumb. So it's not that we shouldn't look at these various rules. We look at lots of equations when we're conducting monetary policy. But we shouldn't be bound by it. 
and we certainly shouldn't be having to explain every time it changes because it just changes too frequently. Monetary policy requires judgment. I don't think there's anything that we can do to legislate that away. And as a result, simple rules are not the solution for making sure that we have appropriate monetary policy going forward. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to entertain questions. Great, thank you very much. So um, I'll ask one, but please uh, get your questions ready, and I'll, I'll go to uh, the, the group right afterwards. Um, you know, you've given a, a, a talk which maybe to the, those who do not follow congressional politics in Washington, D.C. obsessively is, you know, you haven't, you haven't sort of named the central player in your drama. You know, you've been saying there's congressional talk about a simple rule. You don't like the simple rule. But can you talk a bit more about whether you think this kind of political pressure um, is serious? How do you see the election cycle over the next 18 months playing into that? Um, it's obviously interesting that in the wake of the financial crisis, there's been a massive amount of political, whether you call it interference or action or what, on financial regulation, but nothing on, on the monetary policy side. Do you think that's going to change? So we are a creature of Congress. Congress can change uh, the central bank if it so chooses. But ideally, we would think about sensible things to require the central bank to do. One of the areas that Congress has been very concerned about is transparency. I would argue that for monetary policy, we're actually quite transparent in the United States. So after each FOMC meeting, uh, there's a statement that comes out. Every quarter, the chair, currently Janet Yellen, uh, gives a press conference in which she's available to the press. It's televised uh, so that people can see how she responds to various questions. We have minutes that come out that reflect, I think, quite accurately uh, what the tenor of the discussion was. And over time, we have transcripts that give the verbatim discussion. That's much more transparent than many other central banks. It's much more transparent than many other things that central banks do, both domestically and internationally. So a lot of the concern is how transparent is the Federal Reserve. I would actually argue on monetary policy, transparency is something that the United States has actually been quite strong in. That has changed. Uh, when I first came into the Federal Reserve, that was not true. But I think the focus on how do we make the Federal Reserve more transparent, uh, proposals like auditing the Fed, uh, where the most of the focus is actually on monetary policy, there's plenty of opportunity to see what we're doing. Uh, if anything, the most common complaint I hear is that we give too many speeches, not that we give too few speeches. Um, so I don't think transparency would be the area that I would be primarily concerned about for monetary policy in the United States. Right. And who's got a question? Uh, yes, I can see one over there. So wait for the microphone, and then please stand and um, say who you are. Um, hello. Thank you very much indeed for that excellent presentation. Uh, my name is David Riley. I'm from Blue Bay Asset Management. Um, if I may, just two quick questions to take the opportunity. <laughs> Do it one at a time. Um, but one, one, one at a time. Um, the, the, the first one is just in terms of how you think of the trade-off between the fact that obviously monetary policy operates with long and variable lags, but you seem to indicate that you wanted to see greater evidence of wage inflation, which is typically a, a, a lagging indicator of, of inflationary pressure. So excuse me, just how you kind of balance those, um, those two. And then the second... Why don't I answer that one, okay. and then you can quickly okay. answer your second. Uh, and you're right that there are long and variable lags, and that's true for monetary policy. Uh, an important part that I didn't show you was what our projections are for not only 2015, but 2016 and 2017. And you can actually see that many of the forecasts are that inflation's not going to be picking up over the forecast period. I actually have that same forecast that over the next several years, I don't expect that inflation will pick up. Uh, certainly, we should start responding when we start seeing wages and prices are actually picking up. And we don't have to see overall wages increasing, but you should see it in some occupations. You should be seeing some bottlenecks. So it would be fairly odd to have wages and salaries go up very abruptly 
in all occupations without seeing some hit bottlenecks early on. So I, while we have to be cognizant of the lags in monetary policy, at the same time, I think that it's going to be several years before we're even to our inflation target. And if you look globally, the problem is that central banks around the world, many people don't have confidence that they will hit the 2% inflation target. That is consistent with that chart that I showed on 10-year Treasury rates, where you have extremely low rates for 10 years. That isn't consistent with, expect, with being very concerned about how quickly we're going to hit inflation targets. And then second, I, question. So, second question, just very Correct, yeah. short, given your sort of regulatory hat as well. Are there any financial stability issues or concerns that you have given the backdrop of obviously very low interest rates and to some extent declining liquidity, as we saw with the US sort of flash crash? Thank you. Yeah, financial stability, this is something we were actually discussing before we walked in. Uh, it is important to think about financial stability issues. One of the ways that monetary policy does work is by pushing down on short-term rates and treasury securities. You're encouraging people to reach for yield. That's what actually brings other rates down as well. But you can push the rates too low, and you can start getting uh, areas of the economy that have too much financial froth. My own assessment right now is that we're not at that stage where that should offset the fact that we still have an unemployment rate that's too high and an inflation rate that's too low. That doesn't mean we shouldn't monitor it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't care about it. But you have to weigh that against the explicit goals that Congress has given us. And since we're still missing on both measures of the things that Congress has highlighted the Federal Reserve ought to be focused on, I think that outweighs uh, the concerns. I would also highlight that um, central banks, such as the Bank of Japan, we're constantly worried about inflation. They've kept their rates quite low. They actually haven't had a financial stability problem, despite the fact that their rates have been low for a very long period of time. So it's not sufficient just to say that financial stability concerns should trump these other concerns. I actually think that you need to see evidence that those financial stability concerns are becoming a problem. We do monitor that very carefully. It is certainly a legitimate concern, but my own assessment at this time is that we're not seeing the kinds of problems that would offset and argue that uh, we should raise rates prematurely. You were making a contrast also between the UK and the US in terms of the ability to use macroprudential tools to deal with potential. Perhaps you could just elaborate on that. So the governance and structure around thinking about financial stability is very different in the United States than it is in the UK. Uh, you actually have an arrangement that uh, you have both monetary policy, financial policy committee, and supervisory policy, all within the framework of the central bank with fairly clear guidance about what tools that you can actually use. The same thing is not true in the United States. So we have the inflation and unemployment target. We don't actually have anything explicit about financial stability, and we certainly don't have the governance structure that's been set up here in the UK. I would argue that that is something over time that we should take a hard look at. Uh, it does institutionalize a way of thinking about financial stability concerns in a way that have not been integrated in the current U.S. model. It's right over there. Hi, uh, John Geeve, ex-Bank of England, but now with Morgan Stanley and some other private sector firms. Um, I very much agree with you about the case against simple rules and the need for judgment. Uh, my question is... Um, is of what about the rest of the world? A striking fact about your talk is that you didn't really mention the rest of the world. In the field of financial regulation, the response to the crisis has been a really concerted uh, effort, a coordination of policy internationally, which I think has been pretty successful. Uh, there's been no such effort in macroeconomic monetary policy. Is that because it's not necessary or it's not possible, or because you're just not trying? Not necessary or po so well, Not necessary because, you know, the invisible hand will make sure that if everyone pursues their own interest, it'll all work out fine, or it's not possible because it's just too sensitive to talk about international coordination, or it, uh, you know, for whatever reason, people aren't trying. Three alternatives. Yeah. So I would argue that 
economies are in very different places around the world. And the United States and the UK are fortunately closer to um, a point where both uh, they're getting close to full employment and they're getting close to the point where it would be appropriate to raise rates. Uh, Europe, for example, is in a very different place. Uh, it has much higher unemployment rate, it has a much lower inflation rate, and as a result, they are following a very different monetary policy. We may be tightening rates at a time when they're continuing to ease policy through quantitative easing. We've certainly seen exchange rate dynamics, and I didn't show the GDP forecasts, but actually in the United States between December and March, there was a big change in the GDP forecasts. In part, that's reflecting the fact that the exchange rates changed uh, quite substantially, which has meant that in some sense, we're gonna be having a slower growth rate in the United States than we otherwise would have seen because of the monetary policies being taken in other parts of the world. I think that there is certainly discussions about monetary policy, but it's going to be very hard to tell people that they shouldn't focus on their own domestic interests. In some sense, the exchange rate's gonna to have to adapt uh, to the fact that we're at different points in the monetary policy cycle. It's not desirable. Actually, it'd be much easier in the United States to actually uh, grow if we weren't having the dislocations in Europe and in Japan that we've actually experienced. But I can understand why the Bank of Japan and the ECB are following expansionary monetary policy, because at the stage where their economy is, it's quite needed. So in some sense, uh, they've taken some of the risk of a deflation and exported that concern uh, to the United States. Now, fortunately, our economy is strong enough now that that's not a particular problem in the United States, and I do expect that over time we'll hit our 2% inflation target. It is pretty hard to coordinate when you're at different places in your domestic economies. So I think we should be aware of where the economies are around the world. I would not be in favor of trying to use your monetary policy to get trade advantages that are disassociated from uh, the macroeconomic concerns that you have. But nonetheless, I think it probably is appropriate for an expansionary monetary policy in those countries that are still expanding. And I think it is quite appropriate in the UK and the United States to be thinking about when it's appropriate to start tightening rates. So I think that was the invisible hand answer. <laughs> uh, who else has got a question? Right here, yes. The microphone coming. Uh, Mike Dix, uh, Woodwine Asset Management in Caxton. Um, can I ask you about some research that the Fed published last year that looked at sort of Taylor rules, but instead of estimating them on data, used the blue chip uh, consensus forecasts. So you could either do it at the stage at which people were projecting liftoff, or you could look at the whole trajectory mm -hmm. and imply from that the sort of weights that economists were putting on output gaps or unemployment gaps versus inflation gaps in their forecasts and uh, showed somewhat surprisingly that whereas pre-crisis those sorts of data were consistent with the estimated ones on the actual with equal weight on output gaps and on inflation gaps with a half and half on the coefficients but as you saw the private sector learn to get closer to the dots plots the weight on the output gap went up and up and up to 1.6 by the end of 2013 if i recall correctly you know, do you think that implicit message that the Fed is putting rather more weight on the labor market or on the output gap than it used to, and also relative to the inflation gap, is actually consistent with the way that you're looking at the world and making decisions? I think there's another way that you might describe that pattern. So the blue chip forecasts have assumed that we'd get to 2% inflation quite quickly. And if you actually plotted what their forecasts were starting in 2012 and, and followed it sequentially each year, they keep expecting that we'll very quickly get to 2% inflation. Uh, and they've been systematically wrong for the last three years. Actually, if you looked at the summary of economic projections, we haven't been as wrong as the blue chip, but we have been wrong in that it, the economy's been much slower to respond uh, in a way that would get us back to the inflation target quickly. So I think some of that estimated uh, that you're tying to, to changes in the weights might actually reflect the fact that there's been an optimistic assumption about how quickly we would hit our inflation targets, and that's actually what's driving those results. 
So if you're using the blue chip forecast, um, the reason that you would be focusing more on output or the unemployment would be that they don't see us having an undershoot of inflation. My own view has been that we were going to undershoot inflation for some time. So I wouldn't characterize my own view as changing in terms of uh, the weight that I would put on inflation versus an output gap or an unemployment rate gap. Um, so I think it's so more a reflection of the, the forecast that was used in that circumstance. Just the Phillips curve slope or changing in its relationship that others are beginning to recognize, which is not delivering the inflation that they would have expected with the old Phillips curves relationships that they had. That's it, inflation's become a little difficult to forecast over the last few years. Um, many of the inflation models that people are using now assume that because expectations are well anchored, that we'll quickly get back to 2% inflation. As my PCE chart showed, um, over the last few years, we've been missing pretty consistently. That's not the pattern you've actually seen in forecasts. So there's a bit of a disconnect. There was a disconnect before about why inflation didn't come down more. And there's a disconnect now why inflation's not coming up. So I think we have to be fairly humble about how good our equations are, particularly when they're the kinds of shocks that occurred in 2007 and 2008. And that should make us more data dependent and not uh, too confident that the world reflects the models that we're using at the time. Thank you. No, no, I should go to, sorry, go here. Thanks. Uh, Jacques you from Nomura. Uh, maybe a follow-up on the dollar. What would be your rule of thumb of the impact of, I don't know, 10% appreciation in uh, effective exchange rate of the dollar on US GDP? And in that theme, a page book was published uh, this week, uh, and there's quite a bit of comment on the dollar impact on activity. What's your, what, what do you hear in terms of the feedback you're getting in your own uh, district in terms of the, the impact of the dollar? Thank you. Certainly some of the economic data that we've gotten is a little weaker than people were anticipating if you went back to, say, December. In part, that does reflect the fact that uh, the dollar has appreciated so much. Some of the statistics on manufacturing have been weaker than we might have otherwise expected. Those would be export-oriented industries. And I do think a lot of the change in GDP forecast by many of the participants at the FOMC reflects the fact that the exchange rate moved more than they might have anticipated when they made the forecast in December relative to when they were making the forecast in March. So it does have an impact on um, exports and imports in the United States. It has had the impact of meaning that the United States won't grow quite as strongly as it would have if we didn't have this kind of exchange rate movement. Uh, so we have to take the exchange rate movements uh, into account as we're thinking about what our forecast should be for the economy. And that definitely has had an impact, certainly has had an impact on uh, my own forecast, given how much the dollar has risen. Um, at this point, though, I still expect that we're going to get to full employment and get back to our 2% inflation target. But how quickly we're going to do that is partly affected by some of these international dynamics. And with a very strong dollar, it may take us a little bit longer to hit both elements of our mandate than we might otherwise. Uh, that has implications for how quickly we might have to raise rates when it starts becoming appropriate to raise rates. Over here. Hi, Sue Chan from The Telegraph. You outlined several factors in your presentation um, that were sort of bearing down on the natural rate of unemployment. What's your personal view of the, uh, the Nairu? And what's, in your view, what's the biggest factor that's um, been bearing down on that? Also, um, in your opinion, uh, do you think Greece will stay in the Eurozone? <laughs> Let me focus on the Nairu. <laughs> uh, um, so my own view, uh, if I looked back three years ago and you asked me what my uh, measure of full employment was. Uh, it was five and a quarter. And actually in a number of my speeches I highlighted I thought it was five and a quarter. I've have, I have lowered it to 5%. So I have shifted to reflect the fact that for all the reasons that you saw on that, those set of charts, uh, perhaps the most compelling to me is that we're just not seeing wage and price pressures that would be consistent. So. Um, 
If I thought it was at 5.5%, I would have expected to see a little bit more evidence in the data than what we've seen to date. Uh, even at five and a quarter, um, we're only a quarter of a percent away. I would have expected, for example, the disaggregated chart that showed by occupational categories, I would have expected some of those uh, occupations to show more wage and salary pressure than what we've been seeing. So I think 5% is a reasonable uh, estimate right now. I would say, though, if the, if the unemployment rate comes down and we don't see wages and salaries and we don't see any price pressures, I could bring it down further. So uh, it is something that's empirically determined. And if we aren't seeing the wage and price pressures, it may mean that the labor markets have more weakness than are being captured in our models. So uh, it's both inflation and unemployment forecasts have to be thought about in the context of models, but we need to be fairly humble about how well those models have been performing in the post-financial crisis period. And Greece? <laughs> uh, Greece is certainly something that we have to take into consideration for scenarios. Um, one of the reasons it's useful for me to come over across the Atlantic is to get a perspective on how likely and how severe people think uh, Greece problems could eventually become. I would say that uh, at least among some European analysts who assumed that um, for example, a, a Greek exit would not be a problem. Uh, people thought that Lehman wouldn't be a problem either. And so measuring a country by the size of GDP of Europe, if you measure the size of Lehman relative to the US economy, it was quite small. In terms of financial stability concerns, it's really hard to trace the dynamics of how a shock like that filters through both the real economy and financial markets. And so I wouldn't be overly confident that just because the Greek economy is small relative to the size of the European economy, that something like that wouldn't have, be a major dislocation. It may be true that those analysts are right, but I wouldn't have much confidence in that. So it's a scenario that we have to take into account. And so at each FOMC meeting, we actually do talk about negative scenarios. And certainly one of those scenarios would be uh, dislocations that occur because of something happening in Europe. And so it's something that I think everybody should be a little bit concerned about. And I certainly hope that our baseline forecast that doesn't expect a major disruption to occur, such as uh, Greece, uh, actually comes true. But I would certainly be concerned if people got too confident that um, a serious dislocation occurred by Greece wouldn't have broader impact. You certainly heard that in the United States during the financial crisis, and that turned out to be unfortunately quite wrong. Uh, I hope that we've learned from our mistakes in the past. Um, yeah, right here. Thank you. Hi, Diane Sobin, Columbia Threadneedle Investments. Um, to, uh, two part question. One is to what extent is the conversation around the housing market in the US that being uh, progressing quite slowly. Uh, so, so let me answer that part first. Um, so you're right. Housing has progressed more slowly than most economic forecasts in the United States. Um, one of the reasons for why some of our forecasts have been downgraded have been because residential investments not picked up particularly rapidly. Uh, some of that is, I think, the risk aversion that I showed. It's not just currency and demand deposits that have gone up. Uh, I think a lot of Americans have become less convinced that a house is as good an investment as they might have thought in 2004 and 2005. And until very recently, we weren't seeing much of a pickup in household formation. So particularly people coming out of college were tending to live with their parents. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more household formation now. That's a positive sign for housing markets. Uh, but you're completely right that that has been a little bit weaker than we would have expected. And to what extent do you uh, consider that the extreme um, ease in the Fed policy has um, created a negative feedback loop in terms of suppressing inflation expectations and hence suppressing uh, capital investment by not only individuals and, in, let's say, buying houses or corporations and in investing capital to drive employment growth, uh, having an impact on the U.S. economy, again, given the fact that uh, the growth has been certainly um, 
relatively strong uh, versus other developed countries? Yeah, I would argue that actually growth hasn't been as strong as we'd actually like to see. So relative to most recoveries, uh, you normally see a lot more quarters that have a three or a four in front of them rather than a two. And we've actually had relatively modest growth for most of the recovery period. So I would actually attribute it, the weak inflationary expectations I think reflects the fact that the U.S. economy hasn't grown as rapidly as people might have anticipated and that it's weak demand uh, rather than Federal Reserve policy. And I, I would actually argue that Federal Reserve policy being stimulative and trying to get the economy to full employment more quickly is the best way to get inflation expectations back up to 2%. Um, we've seen the opposite in Japan where until the last few years, they hadn't taken aggressive actions, and the result was that inflation expectations stayed quite low, and they had a mild deflationary period for most of the last two decades. One reason that we're actually seeing inflation uh, at the rates that it is is, I think, because we took very aggressive policies both during the financial crisis, um, but even past the, the financial crisis, that have made people reasonably confident that we'll hit our 2% inflation target. And the blue chip forecast still expects that we're going to hit it quite quickly. Um, I'm, I actually think it'll take a little bit longer than uh, what's in the blue chip forecast, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think it's uh, monetary policy that's suppressing expectations. I think it's actually the somewhat weaker growth than we've actually experienced in most recoveries that have suppressed it. I think we can take one more question, if there is one. Just over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Schomburg uh, from Reuters. Uh, one of your colleagues, Mr. Kocalakota, has um, subscribed to the view that the Fed can raise rates both uh, late and slowly, uh, rather uh, contradicting the view that if you don't move early, you, you, you won't be able to move gradually. Do you, do you share that, that view? Uh, and if not, how does the trade-off work for you? So I certainly have some sympathy uh, for waiting longer and then tightening more uh, quickly if that becomes necessary. Uh, a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is we're still at the zero lower bound and to the Greek question. Uh, it doesn't have to be a European shock. It could be a Chinese shock. There are plenty of shocks that you can imagine uh, that could be disruptive to growth in the United States and growth in other countries as well. And so we don't really want to be in a position where uh, we're tightening rates and have to reverse our policy. And so waiting to make sure that there's enough traction in both the U.S. economy and the global economy that we aren't going to have to reverse ourselves, I think is important. And I wouldn't want to get back to the zero lower bound uh, ideally again, but certainly not quickly. And monetary policy, to the extent that we have a negative shock, um, we have less capacity to do it now. So we want to make sure there's sufficient momentum that the economy really is picking up before we start raising rates. As some of my charts have highlighted, I'm not sure even if we delay a little bit that it won't be that we'll find we still have room both in labor markets and that the federal funds rate, that uh, the equilibrium federal funds rate isn't uh, lower so that the definition of what normal is is lower, which means we even if we wait longer, we may not have to uh, raise rates particularly abruptly. Um, so. We've already been pretty patient, but I'm still fairly patient and would like to uh, make sure that we see, I think the two criteria that I laid out at the very beginning of my talk is appropriate. We want to see continued improvement in labor markets. GDP last quarter was 2.2% in the United States. This quarter it's going to be below 2%. That's slower growth than what we would like to see. Um, so it's perfectly appropriate to make sure, you know, we'd be in a different position if we thought labor markets were tightening and GDP growth was quite strong. That's not the set of facts that we're facing right now. And we also are just not seeing that much progress on the inflation front to date. Um, my hope would be that we start seeing data that's consistent with getting back to our 2% inflation target, but it's not strongly in the data, and I think we can wait until we see, see that. So I think the criteria that I laid out in the beginning of my talk are the appropriate criteria. And as I made clear in that first slide, I don't think those criteria have been met yet. Well, in a world economy where um, good news is sometimes a bit scarce, it's nice to hear that in the last few months uh, the assessment of how low unemployment can be driven has become rosier. Uh, 
not all dismal scientists are dismal. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Great audience.